talking about subtypes of melanoma in unique patient populations. These are my disclosures. I will also add that I um, have had travel support from AIM at Melanoma. They have been sponsoring a wonderful symposium for women in melanoma, women physicians. So melanoma, what is it? It is a cancer of melanocytes. Melanocytes are normal pigment producing cells in your body. And the most common place that this starts, what we call the primary tumor, is the skin or what we call cutaneous. The stats that we're going to be talking about are all for the United States, so we're not going to be doing world stats at this point. And invasive melanoma means something more than just at the beginning stages, what we call in situ. So for 2019, the estimated number of new cases of invasive melanoma skin are roughly, or all comers, are almost 100,000. And this continues to rise. If we add in the melanoma in situ cases, these are very early melanomas, that adds almost another 100,000 for that year. And this is the graph that you can see where the incidence of melanoma and it's separated between men and women continues to rise and has been rising for over 30 years at this point. And these are some of the most common risk factors that we think about for skin melanomas. Ultraviolet light exposure, both outside as well as indoor tanning, the number of moles, the higher the number of the moles, presence of atypical or abnormal looking moles, not standard symmetric circles. A family or a personal history of melanoma increases the risk of skin melanomas. Skin type, hair color, eye color, familial melanoma syndromes account for a smaller percent at 10% approximately. And as Dr. Bishu referred to, immunosuppression, an immune system that is not at its normal state. Skin melanomas, are in the top five for cancers in the United States, both for men and for women. The estimated lifetime risk for Caucasian Americans, white Americans is one in 27 men and one in 40 women. And again, this is for the United States. So we're gonna talk about some of the subtypes of melanoma that are less common. And this is a picture of a foot, and that is a melanoma on the bottom of the foot, on the sole. So we call these acral lentiginous melanomas. And this is in a similar category to what we call subungual melanomas. And that means they start on the palms and the soles of the feet or under fingernails or toenails. These are much less common than traditional skin melanomas that start on other parts of your skin. Most commonly, people think about sun exposed sites. So the face, the head, the back, arms and legs. These can be seen in people of color, people of different skin tones, and they account for roughly 1% of all melanomas. Risk factors certainly are ultraviolet light exposure, but as you well know, there is much to be determined to figure out what all of these risk factors are, and there are many unknowns. Treatments and how that differs from standard melanoma, we do similar surgical procedures, but many of you are familiar with the goal of obtaining clear margins where the primary started, and when you are talking about something located under the nail or on a finger, that often can involve actual amputations of a particular digit in order to achieve enough clear margin. Other subtypes, desmoplastic melanoma, if you have heard of that before, these are less common as well. And these often can be skin colored, meaning pink, right? Not dark, not darkly pigmented. We call that amelanotic. And they often involve small nerves in the skin. And so they have a predisposition for having fairly locally aggressive behavior. They often are located on the head and neck area of patients, and they're more common in men compared to women. The risk factors, these increase as people get older, and they certainly correlate with sun exposure as well. Treatment is unique in that in some cases, they may consider doing radiation after surgery. And that's less common that we consider that if we've achieved negative margins. And the idea is because of the locally aggressive behavior and the nerve involvement. Switching gears a little bit, we're gonna leave skin melanomas and now we're gonna talk about mucosal melanomas. So the mucosa are linings of various parts of the body and I've included a variety of locations. This is throughout your body, including the mouth, the nose, the throat, the sinuses, colon and intestine, the vulva and the vagina in women, the urinary system, as well as many more. So melanocytes are scattered throughout your mucosal surfaces as well. And so this can lead to mucosal melanomas. The most common location for all of them is in the head and neck area. 
followed by anorectal sites, then followed by vulvovaginal, and then others much less common after that. And when you factor in all of the melanomas diagnosed in the United States annually, this only accounts for about 1% to 2% of all of those cases. The incidence of this has not been rising in some of the most recent reports, as opposed to skin melanomas. It's fairly even. It's a bit more common in women than men, and one of the questions is, is that related to some of the genital tracts that we see in women? And it's more common as people get older and challenging to diagnose, as one can imagine. One, both because of the presentation. These do not have to be pigmented. These can be flesh-colored, if you will, or non-pigmented, which makes it even more challenging. And sometimes these are in very hidden parts of the body that it's going to take it to get grow large enough to actually cause a symptom for it to be diagnosed. Risk factors at this point, for the most part, remain unknown. We don't know why people get these. Treatment can vary. One of the important things to think about is when we start talking about the actual primary tumor where it originally started, these can be very challenging to obtain clear margins just because of anatomic limitations. When we start talking about trying to remove everything out of someone's sinus, that can be very challenging. And so often we consider radiation after whatever is considered the maximal surgical intervention. When these become more advanced, these can behave typically more aggressively than skin melanomas. We rarely see BRAF mutations, so then BRAF and MEK inhibitors usually are not going to play a role in these cancers. We can see a mutation in another gene called KIT, and again, this is the genes in your cancer, not genes passed on through the family. And these are patients where it may be that there is greater benefit from trying combination immunotherapy ipilimumab in combination with nivolumab over single-agent PD-1 inhibitors, that they may get more benefit out of that in certain circumstances. Ocular or uveal melanomas, melanocytes are also present throughout the eye. And you can see here the uveal tract refers to three parts, the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. You can also have melanomas of the conjunctiva. Some people will refer to skin melanomas involving the eyelid as an eye melanoma, but remember, there are actually multiple different parts of the eye, and the prognosis and how people do and how we treat them is different as well. These account for, again, when you factor in all of the melanomas in the United States, roughly 2 to 4 percent. So again, then when you factor that in, about roughly 95 percent of all melanomas diagnosed in the United States are going to be from the skin. The incidence, again, of this does not appear to be rising as the skin melanomas are. It is a bit more common in men than women. It's more common as people get older. And the risk factors that we know about include UV exposure, familial risk, including familial melanoma, mole syndrome, as well as BAP mutations, and light eyes and fair hair can play a role as well. But again, obviously, there are unknown risk factors at this point. Treatment, the primary tumor is treated a bit differently. Often we talk about radioactive plaque placement. So this is treating the primary tumor with radiation. This involves our radiation oncology colleagues. Sometimes in some centers they are also doing proton therapy to treat these. Or surgical removal of the eye if the melanoma is quite significant and causing symptoms. These patients are followed with ultrasounds of the eye if they have had the plaque placement, which is a bit unique. They are monitored with an ophthalmologist that is specialized in oncology. There is a gene expression test that has been very well validated for eye melanomas that can help give us insight as to how is this melanoma going to behave and the risk of it. And surveillance imaging is often going to involve liver imaging because this is something that typically will spread through the bloodstream, and it often involves the liver. And so MRIs of the liver, ultrasounds of the liver play a very high role. We rarely see BRAF mutations in these patients as well, and they typically behave more aggressively than skin melanomas. They respond less well to immunotherapy. Treatment often may involve some kind of treatment specifically to the liver, whether it's radiation. There are a lot of other terms as well, such as embolization and surgery sometimes. There is a set of mutations in uh, G proteins, GNAQ and GNA11, which are seen for the most part across the board in uveal tract melanomas. And what that means is that actually 
over activates that same pathway that Dr. Lau has been talking about with BRAF and MEK, but it's not because the BRAF is abnormal making it activated, it's because of a different reason it's activated. And so in those circumstances, using the second set of medicines in his line, the MEK inhibitors alone, which are not specific to a certain reason for that pathway to be overactivated, can sometimes be beneficial. But BRAF, which is specific for that particular mutation, if you don't have that target, we would not recommend that. Other unique populations, and this is throughout the course of melanoma, is related to age. Melanoma is something that can affect the very young to the very old, adolescents included, where these are unique cancers. When you think about the typical cancers that children get, this is a bit different. Tanning bed use can be much riskier when it happens earlier on in life. And this is a speculation at this point that this is correlating with some of the rising incidents we see in particular in younger people. The incidence increases with age, but as you can see in the graph, which starts here at less than one and extends all the way up to the very end of the graph. And yes, we have people over 95 in our clinics. Um, you can see an increase, and then it starts decreasing after that. And I've lost my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, among, and this is again United States statistics. For um, people aged 15 to 39, this is the third most common cancer that is diagnosed. In greater than 85-year-olds in the United States, it is number five in incidence for men and number eight for women. And again, this is important to be aware of as people continue on. People of color or people of other skin tones, again, this is a unique population in melanoma for the most part. And you can see on this graph here, the majority of patients are going to be white. But you can see here, we do have patients specifically black. API refers to Asian and Pacific Islanders where melanomas are for the most part quite rare. We also have American patients, Native, as well as Hispanic. You can see here on the other graph on the side, when you start talking about the rate of melanoma, and this is melanoma of the skin, and per 100,000 people, the rate of the uh, white patients at the end is 25.2 per 100,000. But for black and Asian Pacific Islanders, it's approximately one, and it's higher at a roughly five for both um, American Indian, Alaskan Native, as well as Hispanics. Overall, this can be a less expected diagnosis for people with darker skin tones, where skin cancer may not figure into the thought process. It can also present later or at a more advanced state. And it's not the same as it is for skin and eye. And this may reflect on the idea of the role of UV radiation. When you factor in the risk of skin melanomas, mucosal melanomas and ocular melanomas between people who are white or black in the United States, it's 16 times greater for skin melanomas for somebody who is white. It is eight, time, eight to 10 for ocular, where again, UV is felt to play a role. But for mucosals, it's roughly only two times. And again, we believe that for the most part, there is at least less, if not no role of UV radiation in those tumors. So immunotherapies, I'm not going to go in extensive detail, but this defines other unique patients. Immunotherapies, as you've already heard, are meant to stimulate the immune system in a variety of ways or take the break off. And checkpoint inhibitors in particular play a prominent role. This is just to show you all of the FDA approvals for a variety of different checkpoint inhibitors across multiple different cancers. So this is something relevant, not just to melanoma patients, but across the board. The side effects are due to, just as Dr. Bishu and Dr. Lau spoke about, kind of collateral damage. We have revved up the immune system and it's steering off course. And these can be similar to autoimmune conditions, but they're not quite the same. And they are unpredictable. Typically treated with steroids, occasionally needing additional medicines. These often get worse if not diagnosed and treated promptly. So why does that matter? And this is a schematic, and I'm not going to enumerate all of them, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the ADISs that Dr. Lau has been referring to. Well, it matters when we start thinking about people who have an altered immune system before we've even met them. 
organ transplant patients or people who have a suppressed immune system for one reason or another increases the risk of all skin cancers, melanoma as well as basal cell and squamous cell, and these should be seeing a dermatologist on a regular basis. For the most part, all of these patients were not permitted to participate in checkpoint inhibitor trials because of the concern that the risks were too great. So these, when we come to the office, are now on a case-by-case -case basis. One, is it safe to treat them? And two, even if it is safe, will it work the same way with their immune system being different than the standard? This is an ongoing area of research and study. Limited data exists to guide us. And we often say, well, what would be the worst case scenario? One of those is rejection of the organ that was already transplanted. And we proceed with caution. A similar circumstance is for people with pre-existing autoimmune conditions, so lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, vasculitis, neuropathies, and the list goes on. Again, most of these patients were felt to be at too great of a risk to participate in the trials. And so again, we have limited data to guide us and we take it on a case-by-case -case basis. We consider the underlying condition. Has it been dormant? Are there active medications being used? How severe is it? And what parts of the body are involved? And again, proceed with caution and we need more data. In summary, melanoma affects many different people in many different ways. Of exciting medicines are available and others continue to be evaluated in clinical trials. It's important to talk openly with your doctor about your past medical history, about your treatment, about your cancer, as well as any side effects. And matching the person and their melanoma to the right treatment is the key to success. And I also want to emphasize the other keys to success here for us is multidisciplinary collaboration. The people that you may not see behind the scenes include the people who are reading the slides of all the biopsies that we get, local therapy, systemic therapy, ancillary care, and the other people that you met out front. This is to um, say a thank you as well to all of our team members, including our nurses, medical assistants, our social workers, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, who collaborate to make sure that we take the best care of patients possible. Thank you.